so happy to introduce this uh, amazing woman, Lady Hayesbip, to you. I'm warning you, after you hear her story, you can't say anymore that, oh, I want to do this and that, but I can't because I don't have any money. You can't say this anymore because Lady didn't have any money. She worked so hard the whole year, starting with uh, selling cigarettes to American soldiers in Vietnam. In this country, she was working uh, so many things, including as the cleaning lady. And she created several hospitals, schools, and set up uh, libraries, orphan place, and now, you know, doing educational project in Vietnam. She did it. So you can't say, you can't excuse about the money anymore. And also, I'm warning you, you can't say anymore, like, oh, I wish I, like to do, I could do this and that, but I, I don't have any time. She raised up three kids as a single mother, plus so many adopted children, plus had to deal with several relationships with adult guys, <laughs> and then she accomplished such kind of thing. And I'm warning you too that uh, you can't say, I wish I could do this and that, but uh, oh, I'm not uh, young anymore. She's not uh, in her 40s anymore, in her 50s anymore, still 60s, but uh, she's still thinking a new project and a new uh, expansion. This paragraph summarized her story till the year she came to the United States. In May 1970, I stepped from the Pan Nam airliner that had taken me from the hell my country had become to the heaven I hoped America would be. I was 20 years old with two sons, both by different fathers. I didn't speak much English and my manners were better suited to pre uh, peasant villages and Saigon Street corners and the suburb of San Diego, which was to be my new home. A place stranger to a Vietnamese farm girl than the dark side of the moon. My background was not like that of my American neighbors. By age 12, I had lost two brothers and countless uncles, aunts, and cousins to the war. By age 15, I had been in battle, captured, tortured by the South Vietnamese Republicans, and had been condemned to death and raped by the Viet Cong. By 16, I was unwed mother, supporting my family on Danan's black market. By the time I was 19, my father had committed suicide rather than involve me again with the Viet Cong. And I was married to the enemy, enemy middle-aged American civilian construction engineer, Ed Monroe, in the desperate hope that he would save me and my children from the war. So now, without further ado, uh, let's introduce and welcome Lily Hayslip. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Can you hear me without me? Well, maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, good afternoon. I came all the way from San Diego to here because I heard that you have a lot of questions for me. And so I'm ready to answer it the best I could. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for the lovely couples. I don't know if you see that or not, but they major each other evenly. 
both of them. <laughs> so last night I asked them that you really did that on purpose. <laughs> just to let you know that it's the karma. If you believe in reincarnation and karma and all that, you look at them, they get evenly, thinking alike, have the same compassion and understand. So I'm just so happy to be here with both of you and with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. So we tend to forget after uh, Vietnam War. We know about the Vietnam War, and after that we forgot. But uh, after the war, U.S. and Vietnam uh, cut off the uh, diplomatic relationship, and the lady even couldn't uh, send a T-shirt or medication to her family in Vietnam. So, and plus, U.S. citizens, they hated, hated the Vietnamese. They hated you, right? Yeah, so and um, even CIA chased you, right? So and the uh, UN was uh, against you. Mm -hmm. So, but she actually changed everything. She even brought American soldier who was in Vietnam before, she brought them to Vietnam and let them help her to um, make a hospital, everything. So. We like to know the uh, secret. How did you do that? Okay, you can sit down. Oh, and, thank uh, you. Talk. Thank you. Um, you talk about secrets. If I, that is a secret, then I can't tell you. <laughs> right? It's true. <laughs> <laughs> there is no secret. Is um, you see something just need to be done. It's uh, nobody tell you have to do it, or nobody tell you uh, not to do it. So it's an, it's you. Every one of us, we have our own choice, and we have our own um, decision to make. Um, we also have six senses. No, is it dangerous, or is not dangerous? Um, I've been near to death many times before, and so what is there to be afraid of? Uh, anything that I am afraid, that means again my will, again my hear what to do. It's unlimited. Everything is uh, a choice, a chance, and it's also up to individual. And um, if a secret, only secret then is a, the thing that like the Vietnamese government think that I work for CIA. <laughs> and the more I say no, the more secrets, for example. Um, when I was in, um, I traveled around to promote the film and the books, and I called home to my brother in Da Nang and say, um, yeah, I would like to build maybe 100 toilets for the poor people so they don't have to go outside everywhere and it's very uh, not good for a sanitation. And so I asked my brother to check to see how much for one toilet needs to be built in somebody's houses and uh, give me the budget. Well, the commoners in those days always listen to my phone call. And so when I come back, my brother asked me, did it a CIA coach talk about the toilets? Because why sure somebody like me come from the U.S. and want to build toilets for the poor, you know? So that is a secret. So I make sure that don't say anything that really uh, make they think that I work for CIA. Whereas in the U.S., they think I work for the communists. <laughs> so the two FBI come to my house and very serious to ask me three questions. Why did I go to Vietnam? And what am I'm doing over there? And who did I see? in Vietnam. So as a secret, well, 
I don't have any secrets, so I have to tell the truth. Why not Vietnam? Because I am Vietnamese. And I see my brother, sister, and mother. And I wanted to go back and to help now that after I see that they need help. Well, to them, all that is also secrets because they think that the communists of Vietnam uh, tell me to be spy and to go back and bring the information back and forth and all that. So the secret is the main thing. The secret is whatever other thing and name and give you a label, it's a secret. But to me, it's no secret. It's open. And as long as I can able to do without cutting anybody's life, it's not hurting anybody, it's not suffering anyone, it's just an open book to do. So it's no secrets. So I hope that I answered the question. Yeah. Okay. So um, everybody, I believe, I want to ask you uh, how to uh, develop, uh, establish your NPO, and how to involve the, uh, so many people to realize uh, you are, uh, you know, dream and the hope and what you want. But before that, you told me that um, mindfulness is the most important uh, in this um, world. You know, especially this period, because uh, you saw uh, on, uh, hatred in Vietnam and the U.S. And, um, you know, everyone is divided and separated, and uh, you seeked spiritual help. And uh, you could trust uh, oneness, one mind, equality. Equality is not about height, it's about, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, mind. And um, um, you went to a church because all of the Americans around you uh, went to church and uh, you couldn't fit there. And about uh, Buddhism uh, monks and uh, Course Miracles, that's a spirituality just uh, saved you. So then can you talk about that uh, spiritual path a little bit? Um, after I become a uh, second time widowhood, which is um, the first widow uh, when I was 22 years old in 1972, when I first came in America uh, with two little children, and uh, my husband passed away of emphysema, smoking too much. And then um, English is very little uh, those days, and my um, three years old sons and five years old, two years old and five years old. Um, keep asking about the daddy, where the daddy? And I keep saying, he in the oven. They walk over and open up an oven and look in there. And <laughs> <laughs> say heaven. <laughs> so that is a one of many, <laughs> you can call it stupidness, you can call it, you know, whatever. But that is my learning English process. After he died, um, I was busy at uh, learn how to drive and find the way, and I got lost more than to find my way. But that is uh, make me more confident. The more I got lost, the more I confident with myself. And then um, I did a lot of house cleaning for two dollar and fifty cent per house. Someday I can do two houses. And, but that is uh, make me happy because I can sing, uh, I can mop the floor, and I can do a lot of things. It makes me feel good to do something. But then I remarry again in 1975. Um, uh, then 1983, he also passed away. But this time is I'm a little more aware of about American and about the living religion and about um, uh, politics, and so I can able to fight back, and I can able to argue, and I can able to debate. So what my in family is after 1975, when the Vietnam War ended, uh, I bring in 17, 40 children, all boys. In the, the 17 boys, some is Catholics, some is uh, Buddhist, but we have two 
three different branches, branches. and some is uh, cow dye, and that is another different branches of Buddhism, and another mostly is um, it's no religion. And so we get together, the family, and my husband, Dennis Hesley, and our three children, it all have baptized in Southern Baptist Church. But, uh, one Sunday morning, we're working in a garden, and this beautiful young Chinese girl, uh, she came to the neighborhood and picked up the children to go to Sunday school. And she saw my children play in the front yard. We just moved in a new neighborhood, so we didn't know anybody. And she stopped and she asked permission, can she take my children to Sunday school? To me, it's just, wow, beautiful. <laughs> somebody, somebody come and pick your children to go to church and teach them some good things. That is just wonderful. So I said, yes, why not? Yeah, send children to school. <coughs> well, little by little, they learn whatever in church, and then they come back and they read the Bible for me, and they tell me all about wonderful Jesus did for them, and and how the um, I will burn to hell if I don't get rid of my uh, Buddha statue in the house and worship and you know do all kind of funny stuff they call. And my husband, on the other hand, always send uh, every Wednesday he send a lady uh, named Judy uh, from church come to teach me Bible. And then uh, one in a while to preach from the church come and want to do a. Um, uh, what is it? Um, evil worship the evil, and they come and have a uh, uh, exorcism. Yeah, <laughs> because you know now uh, the Buddhist image it is evil, and so I didn't learn anything from Bible study every Wednesday because <laughs> I'm talking about food, I'm talking about herb, I'm talking about um, funny stuff because I don't like what the Bible, I, I don't understand it. But then um, when the, the priest came and tried to ask me to come to have a baptize in the church, I feel very angry. I just don't know why I'm just reacting. It's just not right. And every time I go to church, um, I hear what she say. I understand most of it, and I see what the Jesus uh, on the cross in the wall. It scared me. It scared me because in 1960, back into my village in Vietnam, every morning my father came out with a bamboo stick and he looking for fresh grave. Because the night before, there are many Buddhist monks being killed and some of them buried alive. And first they kill all the monks, and then they kill all the teachers and the leader in the village. So nobody needs to say anything. So the only thing we can do is to recover the monk body and people uh, to rebury them. So when I see that cause, it reminds me back in those days. We get the Catholics to kill Buddhists. Mm -hmm. but then we ask the Catholic, Catholics say, communist, yes. And if we ask the Viet Cong who is communist, they say, that is uh, uh, communist. So everybody say around and around and around, but the monk end up dead. And so when I listen and I see the Jesus and I see all those things, it just scares me. But I can't explain it to anybody. And so we fought, we argued, and finally my husband died in 1983. It put me a lot of guilt if I think, oh, if I go to church, and if I obey him to have baptized, maybe God save me, just like he keeps saying. And maybe true, maybe evil in me, maybe something. And so I had a lot of um, uh, unhappy moments. And I feel guilty, I feel bad here, I end up with three sons and no father, and then all these 40 children in a house, and each of them have their own sadness to deal with. And so I thought, okay, first thing first, I have to get that out of my mind. It to go into this, um, called the uh, philosophical library. 
It's in Atkendedos, California, near to where I live. And that is when I found the Court of Marriage. That is when I found all the teachers and the leaders and all the peoples. It's not any religion. We call New Age, but to me it's an old age. <laughs> because um, we're talking about the thing that in the village we, we do every day. You talk to Mother Nature, you pray for Father, you discuss about your ancestors, and you make an offer. If you harvest the rice or you harvest uh, some good fruit or you catch a good fish in a pond, first thing first you make an offer to heaven. Father, because that is who give out the food, and we offer to Mother, because she give out water to drink. She gave out all the love and kindness that we plant in her ground every day. And we're talking about many things, like love and compassion, and give it to your neighbor, and share uh, with everyone that you no, or you don't even know if they need help, you help you. All this thing is connected with what I grew up. Uh, as a young girl in the village, every year we harvest the rice twice a year. And every time we harvest some good rice, first we make an offer to heaven, and then a second that we send out to uncles, to leaders in the village, to people that we call uncle and auntie, and who we just love. And as a young girl, I'm so afraid of ghosts because you have to run a quarter cemetery and river and pond to go to another village to give that little rice. And yes, it's very important. You have to do it. And so I learned that everything before you eat, you have to make an offer to others. But then little by little, now I learn into this culture like this and many um, teachers and guiding come and share. And I thought, wow, I discovered something like a root. I found it. And, but in that doesn't help me with how my husband died and what is the difference from what the teaching here today and what it in the Baptist church that the priest tell my son and ask my husband to help me to come to church. So I take out five years of my life. Every day I come to this library. I volunteer so I can listen to the lecture and I read book and I be in a group. And same time I study religion to find out if I, if I have baptized in a Baptist church, if I follow what my husband and children ask me to do, I may be a better person. But the problem is, the more I try to go that way, the more I'm unhappy. But if I just let the court take me, just be me, and don't try to fight with in my mind, with right or wrong, or with good or bad, or who doing what, it, it, it doesn't matter. So little by little, I feel very happy to discuss about New Age, about uh, different teachers talking about life after death, the reincarnation, uh, how to be good. Almost this thing just make me life. It bring me out of the darkness days and time. So little by little, I choose to be nobody but me, myself. Because what we think that I learn it is only good for me. I don't know it's good for you or not, but who am I? Where I'm coming from? And what I'm coming here for? And that is what I'm trying to find. And that is what the answers that I am looking for myself. And I hope that I found it. I'm still looking, but I may be found it. And so that is the answer that if you Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And uh, you said that um, um, about the sharing, and you did a great share through your writing. So this Oliver Stone movie is a good movie, but uh, the original story was written by her. 
So two big books are uh, in English and uh, in Japanese are divided for four and uh, translated into 27 uh, languages except Vietnamese. <laughs> so and um, that sharing was just a, something. So as a GIA writer, I know GIA it's really hard to express everything like that. that. In that book, you are wisdom and clarity and openness, everything there. So even when you have a great, great, deep, deep guilty feeling, you describe that guilty feeling very well with clarity. So it's wonderful, but uh, what uh, was the, um, um, what drove you, drove you to write such a big share? What kind of passion brought you to uh, real, realize uh, that the uh, book, the situation and everything? Um, after the Vietnam War, or oh, in Vietnam we call it American War, <laughs> and uh, when the war ended, um, a lot of books come out by the American veterans who have been there one year, two years, uh, some journalists, and many of the other uh, people study history and all that. So I start to write about Vietnam. And because I could not understand 100% what they try to say in there. But I understand enough that it, I have to ask myself, what do these people know about Vietnam? Here, yeah, they write about Vietnamese, they describe about graveyard, they describe about rice paddy, they describe Viet Cong, they describe roots, they describe all about Vietnamese. They're not Vietnamese. You talk about Vietnamese, we should, Vietnamese should write it and talking about the rice paddy and graveyard. It's just about the people who born and raised in the graveyard and in the paddy, right? And so the way that they describe about the Viet Cong, the commoners, I asked, who is Viet Cong? What do they know about Viet Cong? The commoners, what is commoners? You know, to me, it's just different than what they say in the book. So, little by little, um, I thought back, okay, in 1970s, when I first came to the U.S., uh, I lived with my mother-in-law, um, Monroe's families, whose own, my husband is from World War II, so he born 1950, and I born 1950, okay, so that is the big difference. So he been to World War II, two of his sons in Navy in Vietnam, and his brothers and brother-in-law's own in Navy. So we live in San Diego, a big Navy town. So let's see the war is different. Let's see the war is uh, um, American come to Vietnam to help the Vietnamese people. And here, I am come from other side. And every evening, the news, we watch the news. And, uh, uh, news come on and talk about, oh, uh, Vietnamese, many battle fight today and how many American body that to carry home and how many born there. And my family in law looking at me and say, Shame on you, shame on you. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't kill our people. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, well, wow. But then every time they see the Vietnamese villagers, so house burning and people crying and mother and children wounded and it's just sad to look at me to say, you shouldn't like to kill people. You know, and I just, I have no word to express myself. I have no English or no understanding, and it's a scare and to be into their family and listen to them. So all that I just impress, express it down and get carried somewhere. Until when I start into thinking about writing book and all that, the question is, how these people in America understand about Vietnam or know what we will do. Mm -hmm. And so I have on the note down a lot of questions, but no answer. Until the time that I went back to Vietnam in 1986. The country is just so poor. Vietnam is just so poor. And 
I see it. My brother is common. I see everybody now is common. But they're still people. They're just Vietnamese. They just have a label, have a name. And so I come back, and at that time I own five houses in San Diego and a big restaurant. And every day I went to work at 10 o'clock. Open the restaurant open at 11, and I didn't get home until 11 p.m. My three children went to bed without food. And after I come back from Vietnam, I see the Vietnamese is start with, with the people in those days is starving to death. It's so poor. It's no health care, no nothing. Just like North Korea right now, you can imagine. In 1986, Vietnam, just like North Korea today. And here I come back with all this food that I waste in my restaurant every day. <coughs> People very uh, nasty sometimes if the hot the food is too cold or the uh, not come up fast enough or you know too hot or too cold or too sour or too something always something and here in Vietnam it just <coughs> different it opposite and so I thought to myself I said is it, there is another way there is another way so first thing first. After, especially after the two FBI came to my house, and I brought home some fortune cookie, and offered him cookie and tea so that I can answer his question. And after the two FBI left, I thought to myself, there must a way. There is a different way because the way that I try to make money and own own these houses and have a restaurant, it makes me very depressed. I'm not happy. And went to Vietnam, and people so much needed help and so poor that it needed me more than all this, my custom in a restaurant. So first thing first, I saw my restaurant, and I involved with a corn artist, and he come and he helped me to corn my house and all my money, whatever. So I back into nothing. Not only I lost everything, but it also is very shameful with my children and my friend. And you know, here we engage and we're supposed to get married, but right now he gone all it. And so, what I'm going to do? That is when I'm heavily involved with the American uh, medical courses because it helped me to pull me out of those days. And so, the more I learned, the more. Heal me the most is to start to write the note, start to answer the question that I could not answer about Vietnam and about the United States. So I sold my three beach houses and moved into a small house up in the hill. And I looked down a valley, it's a, called Hidden Valley. If you ever go in there, you can see it's an American and Spanish war fought again there, way back when. And so every night, I. Uh, feel a lot of ghosts, a lot of spirits to came. And I meditated and I um, feeling that they're there to help me to write these books. When I bought the house uh, with the motion that I would like to turn this play into a meditation center and get all the ghosts to come in and uh, make it a harmony with the land. So that's what my attention. But when I lived there, I, oh, many different spirits come, and many different um, messages that I get. And when I start to write, it just writes itself. The word to come in, and the feeling, and the, the compassion, and it just, oh, I have two all over now. It just, um, it come to them. It come to this dead soldier, Spanish, Indian, American. Down there. And that is why the book, it come out so good. It's also, I, I give up everything and just concentrate on the book. And what it come out from the book? So I have a choice. I can tell lie, I can make up the story, or I can just tell the truth. And if I tell the truth, everything happened, good, bad, or ugly, I'm not the first one to be raped. I'm not the first one to sell myself for $400. <coughs> I'm not the first one to uh, be 
had your son at 18 years old, and I'm not the first one who has uh, do all the horrible things. I'm just 18 years old. I'm just 14 years old to happen to be live in a war zone, to be <coughs> tortured and to be raped and to be, you know, all those things. It come to me. I did not go out looking for it. So, what is there for me to hide? It's no secrets. It happened to me. It just like happened to every one woman live in the war zone. So I thought over and I worry about my three children. What would they say if I tell the truth? Nothing but the truth. But then I feel, no, they need to know. If they don't need to know, they don't have to read it. But it's my life. In Vietnamese, we call it Sao Che Tau Khoe. That means hide the bad, show off the good. <coughs> but everything in America, the bad thing is sometimes turning good. And something that I learned from life, or especially my life, everything bad is turning good for me now. Because I can share with you, and I can talk about it. And it's healing me. It's making me feel like, yeah, I'm not the only one. There are many people like this, so I talk about it. So I told Julie, and honestly, that is why my book is banned in Vietnam. The movie is banned in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. In the American, you accept, yeah, the military man is bad. Not all of them bad, just some of them bad. The government did the bad thing, but it doesn't mean that I don't love American. I love to live here. That is the way it should be. But at the Vietnamese and communist country, if you talk bad about the party or you talk bad about the communists or to Viet Cong help, uh, uh, rape me or send my mother out and execute her, all these things that no, it's secret. To me, it's not secret. You did it in public. You did it to many, many women and people. How it can be secret? But you're not supposed to, to tell the truth. So that's why my book is banned in Vietnam. So I uh, answer your long question that uh, how did I start the book? Mm -hmm. And when I write the books, the question then is, what did the purpose write in this book? Right. What is the purpose for me to tell all about horrible things happened to me and to my family and to my country? What will I do? I know. American people are very compassionate. And if they read the book and make them cry and make their life, and they say, oh, how can I help? How can they do? And we have to have a channel, we have to have something so that for them to contribute and to help. So therefore, I established a first nonprofit foundation called Ismic Web. So this way, if somebody reads the book and they're compassionate, they have uh, a way of to donate or giving, why not? Mm -hmm. That is why um, it happened. Yeah. So could you find the publisher soon, oh. easily? Of course not. Well, the what can the I um, <laughs> find a good publisher when you only third grade education? Mm -hmm. And so, um, of course, sent out many, many, um, just like an outline story, mm -hmm. and many reach it. I think 21 different I'm reaching. And in those days, that nobody wanted to hear about Vietnam. Yeah. And um, everything, you know, we reject, reject, reject. But then um, I pay $375 for a weekend uh, conference. We call a um, publisher and book conference in San Diego. And um, at that time, I just so depressed, I just really want to know this, write this book, and I have no idea how to do it, and so. So here I went to San Diego, and um, first day, you know, just get together and introduce and talk about many things. The second day, uh, to get together a small group, 10 people in a group, and each group is led by an editor from a major uh, publisher house from here, New York. And so he give each person uh, five or ten minutes to sell their books, tell their story. And everybody, of course, uh, everyone have a book in mind. That's why they come there. And uh, 
their book was, okay, you know, how uh, to quit smoking, uh, how to lose weight, <laughs> um, how can I find a perfect uh, husband or wife or uh, be successful or whatever. You know, in 10 people in group, we have 10 books, he said. And here my book. <laughs> Too heavy. <laughs> and so uh, after I present my book and they all go back and they look at each other and you know, it just, I, I feel so bad, I feel so bad that I have to, you know, not even that, but I cry because it just, you know, it's so heavy on me and it's just so big story and see like, who cares, you know? So that particular night I have to uh, commit, admit, I came home and I cried. I cried because it just feel like the whole world know about Vietnam. And what happened in Vietnam, it had been on the news here in America every day. And it's the first little girl trying to tell the world about her story. And two, three thousand people in the audience, and they have all, you know, ideal, beautiful book, good book. And so, oh, there, there's no chance, you know. So I just cry. I, I meditated after that, and I feel very good at that. So the next day, after all that together, and it's um, <coughs> afternoon, uh, get together, and, you know, people raise their hand up if they have questions or anything like that. I just stood up, and I hold my whole book out there, and I say, this is my life story. You know, then... I just need you to take it and find a way to tell the world the story because it needs to be told. And everybody silence and after that. But that is where I found the publisher, where I found my agent, and where I found my co-writer. Mm -hmm. And I think that quiet that night and that commitment and I just stood up there, then people know that my English is, is not good. They see that I'm sincere, and they know that, you know, I'm from Vietnam, and I must have a story. And so from that on, it, it, it's so. And so when the book, it committed uh, a double day, um, accepted the, um, the book, they give it one year to, to, um, to work on that. But before all this, I've been to many psychics. I've been to many fortune tellers. <laughs> I've been to many readers <laughs> to try to find out where this work published. And they all say, like, you have mission to do on earth. That is your mission. You come here to do this. You are here to deliver this and this. I have no clue, you know? <coughs> and so everybody keep telling me, you know, Keep doing that. Don't give up and did that. So I did it. And I, I think it, I'm trying, but there are different dimensions. There are people out there that look after me and send me to the right place. And um, uh, another funny story. Um, after I come back from Vietnam in 1986, and I want to write this book so bad, I sit down and write a, um, you would call it a proposal, uh, uh, object and um, uh, idea and all that put in mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. But to me, to me, I said this is a contract with God. Because first, I want to write the books. And book much into a movie. Now, this is all stupid idea, okay? Um, first, I write the books. The book much into a movie. And then all this money, I will give back to Vietnam. I will do uh, like God wants me to do. Uh, build a clinic, build hospital, build universities, schools, help the poor. I mean, everything, everything. It's just right in front of me. All this thing. And, um, but, I can't write. I'm not a writer. I don't have an education. What I'm going to do? So the goal is, is there. But the objective, how? How can my dear girl 
go to become reality. And so I said, okay, I made a contract with God and did it God job. The God job is to send me a right people, send me a right publisher, send me a right writer. You know, the thing that I cannot do. That is out of my control. So I let God do that part. My job is to work 724 and not be lazy, not try to play game with it, just to be truthful. So that is my part. And we be partner, and I give my life to him. And I say, I work for you at a, a daughter, and you do the rest. And I asked the man who Vietnam veteran, um, had a good friend, and he's uh, uh, very good with the uh, writing proposal and things. So I asked him to help me to edit it. And he looked at it and he said, Lely, it will take you 10 lifetimes to do all this thing. I look at him and I said, Peter, you give me minimum three years and maximum five years. And you know what? in their five years. Mm -hmm. I had two books, a movie, three documentary, and a hospital, a medical center, <laughs> and a clinic, <laughs> and orphanage. <laughs> you know? This is true. God is out there. Mm -hmm. And he, he give you, maybe one way or another, but that is he did for me. So, what, what name you? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, so as you said that uh, no one in this country uh, interested in uh, how Vietnam was. And uh, of course, that aftermath of the Vietnam War, you know, we are focusing on um, that aftermath in this country, you know, um, including PTSD like uh, your husband. So, but uh, we didn't care the uh, Vietnam and uh, Right now, this moment, the uh, effect of uh, orange agent is uh, still there. So many things are there. So we don't know. American basically don't know. So, but uh, you saw everything, you know, back then and till now. So, how do you say uh, the, what do you saw the uh, perceived, uh, you know? Vietnam, the circumstances, the conditions, of what uh, you needed to help, what... Uh, what so shocked me the most uh, to have been here now at 45 years. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many of you read my books, uh, especially in second books. Mm -hmm. um, in my lifetime, now I'm 67 years old, and I see the God from day one, Vietnam fought against the French. And you see military guy, not in a family, but members of uh, Vietnam, who is my brother involved. Um, the young boys, they all have a gun. And then, of course, uh, the French have not only gun, but many different ammunition to go with the gun. And then, after the little children, we so scared. If each time you see the Frenchman, he big and tall and carry on the gun and with him. So we just so afraid. Um, the bomb drop and all those suffering people every day and you know, that is part of life. But then I grew up in 1960, I was 10 years old, then American war started. So here, all over again, all the young men and women in the village have gun, have hand grenades have knife, have the thing that protect themselves or kill somebody else. And here we village you, we don't own any of that. We only can give out mm, uh, secrets, we only can share with what we know and all those things to keep out, out alive. And so I came over here, uh, my first husband Monroe, he a World War II veteran, and on his photo with God, and the picture of him in a battlefield and all of that, and he showed it to me. And then I married to, after he died, I married to Dennis Hayslip. He's uh, in Korea War. And here he fought though, with military, with gun, with battlefield, with all that. So I mean, it's an image of war. It's just something like candy. Everybody have a picture with Santa Claus, you know? And to me, it's just amazing. 
But coming to when my husband, Dennis Hayslip, invest money in gun. And he own 10 gun, some short, some high, some small, some big. That's all I know, gun. And it's dangerous. We have three sons, and he showed the gun to the boys. And he teach the boy how to shoot. And he want to take the boy to uh, Utah. He buys 40 acres of land so they all can go hunting. But then he buy another 20 acres of land in Idaho so where he can go fishing. And with all this gun. That is when I thought, enough is enough. In the family, I turned the gun into police, some of us. And I buy a cage, a locket, I throw the key away. <laughs> you know, I try to do everything just to stop gun, but it doesn't work. We have more argument on the gun in the house than gun and religion and a commoner. That's the thing that is fight in the house. And so um, when, after he died, I get rid of all the gun, everything, everything. And then when I'm taking the course of the um, new age and just find myself. What I learned one thing that um, I have a choice, or anyone have a choice. Um, if I go out and a uh, shopping list, I write down what I need to buy for help my body and keep my three children alive. So you write down rice, uh, feet, onion, and all those things. That is your shopping list. If I want to go to Kmart or shopping store, I write pair of shoes or new pen or whatever. That I need. Now, other one, I see all my notes for my husband who looking for gun. He study about gun, um, killing, uh, bullets. It is opposite. It's only thing his my thinking is killing. A killing a deer, a killing a man, a killing to somebody just happened to step in our yard. It's wrong. It's really wrong. But how can when he belong into that NRA level, that group it, and that own magazine it come in and that is one that is all they're talking about. And so I feel very uneasy. But when the time for me to come to clear up my mind and find myself, I said, yeah, this is, I have a joy now to choose what I want on the shopping list. You do have a joy. You have your money in your pocket and you can buy anything. Why not buy something that gives you sell joy, joy pizza, joy food, joy sushi, <laughs> joy fur, or can give yourself a new clothes, new makeup, and new something. Or if you want to do further, give it to the poor. A chill with someone that needs help, <coughs> just like Vietnamese, just like down the border of Mexico. I mean, that, it makes me happy. Every time I think about that, it makes me happy. But every time I think about going to church and read about the gun and see the gun, it makes me feel angry. I don't know why. So. What I learned through all this is go with your feeling. If you're hungry, you make a phone call and you have deliver the, you have pizza or Chinese food delivered at your front door, right? Or you have to get in a car and go there. The same with our soul. Our soul come to earth, do what it needs to get done. So they can be hungry for spiritual. You can be hungry for go out and sweep the street. Somebody enjoy to do that, or we bookkeeping, or um, housekeeping, whatever. They feel good to do that, maybe not. But if it go something again, you, or go something that it might hurt others and suffering others and cause a lot of chaos for the world, we should stay away from it. And every time they are left and right, they are black and white, they are day and night. So we do have a choice to make. But I don't know why my husband made that choice. <laughs> and I think because he's a military. 
bigger to read the magazine and to be with the group of people that I'm talking about. And, and you can see how chaos we have. And that is why country like Vietnam, they have very much control, yes. They have no freedom, yes. But it's safe. Only bullets. Even bullets don't have a gun until last couple of years when they can buy it from the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know? So that is what is between uh, safety and uh, chaos society. So that is now to see what go around the world. It's because of God, because of bomb. I had three sons, and um, after they come back from Vietnam, and um, uh, one of my son, Tommy, middle son, uh, his friend uh, also graduated from high school at the same time, and they joined army. And so after uh, uh, I took them back to Vietnam, and they see that who the communist really was. Uh, they come back, and he meet with his friend, and um, he told his friend that, oh, I just come back from Vietnam. And his friend, his friend rode up together in the same neighborhood and said, where? Vietnam, not of South. And he said, you stupid. It's now just only one Vietnam. And he said, oh, no, not is uh, communist. And uh, if you go there and, and, and you know, uh, communist, and I don't want to talk to you, la, la, la. And my son said, wow, that is way him up. It really teach him, it is, wow. What you believe is it, it what it's all about. And so my son shared with him about the communists and his uncle and his auntie and his grandma. It's Vietnamese. It's not the communist. It's just a name. It's just a label. But he come back and shared with me and he said, Mom, now I can see what you struggle. What you struggle with the label. What you struggle with the name that people give me. And then they stuck with that. And then that is why they have a war. And the more I hear, the more I see what the military turn into and how the American policy and the deal with uh, weapon and all that. Um, I think that uh, the time, about time, every one of us, uh, we should say something. Uh, maybe we not say enough. Maybe we not uh, have a, uh, a strong sense uh, come out and talk about peace. I know that. Every year, how many of you go out there and protest? Protest against war, protest against um, many different issues. But now look at the, uh, the uh, refugees around the world, uh, the problems, the human trafficking, the, um, I mean, it's all kind of problem. Um, in the U.S., we're very, um, um, more like in the box. Uh, but until you travel out of the third world country and you see the situation and you be on a lot of panels to talk about the issue at it today, it's amazing how big problem we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. But there are two sides. Uh, when I talk about this, I want to say two sides. Here we talk about human being. That means you have a body, we have a feeling, uh, we feel sorry for the refugee, and we feel sorry for the wisdom of all the horrible, horrible things. We all see it every day on CNN and on the news. And we feel so hopeless, and we feel so powerless, and nothing we can do. So we just let it be. But on spiritual level, we have to say it this way. We try our best. We do what we can. And the rest of us, it has to work it out itself. Because the problem is so big. And about the time, maybe it's evil. It's progress. This world, we all know, it is very, very old. In early days, where we had all this dinosaur, they not only eat leaves and eat the plants, but they also eat a lot of other dinosaurs. Anything smaller than them, they eat. And they kill a lot. So maybe one asteroid come in and just say, yeah, wipe them out. And the evil do into a human body. Evil do into us. Evil do in our ancestors in those days. And woke up to now. 
And here, we're very smart, we're intelligent, we know how to make a lot of money, we know how to build a little tiny telephone and uh, bring the whole world together. I mean, we came far, far, far away. But the more we came far away, the more we run around and kill with so many people. We kill so many people around the world. For help, the time, we just like dinosaurs dead. You know, my, my children hear that say, Mom, no, my children too young. I want them to live. I don't want them to, to die. But as to me, I say, what wrong if we recycle? What wrong if I come back and I have iPhone 6S? Right now I have an iPhone 4, and I don't know how to use it. <laughs> you know, I need to not only recycle my phone, but recycle me first. So I know how to use the phone. If we own recycle for 21st century, we don't learn how to build bomb and gun, but we build schools and clinics and help the poor and one language and one brothers and one family of mankind. You know, if we think it that way, we're thinking about how we uplifting from this bodiness to on sea world, we maybe come back in different mind, in different heart, in different soul. You know? Now it's a car come out with no need driver. Maybe we come back and we just say, wow, how beautiful. And we don't have to ride there and struggle in this and that. We just free and enjoy life. It will be beautiful. Mm -hmm. See, that is what I hope. And that is what I'm focusing on, on that spiritual level. Because nothing I can do for the refugee. Nothing I can do for all the moment. Look at how much money you have put every year in the, the war. <laughs> if the pocket money I can, you know, help the poor country, I would do so, but they won't give it to me. You know? <laughs> so nothing I can do. But I can volunteer <coughs> and I can go there and do so. That I can do. So that answers yeah. your question? Yes, yes, yes. And uh, in your story, young lady was thinking, oh, I can't believe uh, there is any human being who can die in the bed because i never seen such kind of a person in my life because all the people around you died on the street and the field and the, in the war. So then after the war, what you did is the uh, first is you uh, making um, um, hospital to save a body. But uh, the other day you told me that the most important thing is, and uh, still in Vietnam, uh, not only uh, you know, effect of orange agent, um, uh, diabetes patients died, dying in Vietnam because of lack of insulin. Still so many, so many issues there. But uh, more than that, you said that the education is most important for not only for Vietnamese, and, but also everything. But now you bring up the spirituality, spiritual level we have to um, keep and share. It's a uh, hope, you say, right? Um, we grow up in Vietnam. Um, we don't have clinics. We don't have doctors. We only have midwives. She come to the house and deliver the you. Mm. And if you sit, you go in a Harvard, the herb. If you like my mom mm. sent me out for Harvard night of this, seven of those for my father and for woman at night. And I come home and you do this and you do that and then my tea out of it and they drink and then it get well. And so that's all I know about herb. Everything I know is herb. And so um, my mother make it into 102 when she passed away. And she like about 90 or 80 pounds time she passed. Uh, my, all my brother and sister, they are over 75 now. And I'm the baby. Mm -hmm. and so I see how they eat. And I see how uh, healthy 
they be. Uh, one is Jin, but the second is the way they live their life. But then every time we, I go back to the village now, uh, my sister also make sure that I bring this tea, I bring this herb, and make sure that I have this that. But the deep diabetes, and of course besides the landmine and the HNO and the problem, but um, the Chinese recently, not recently, but the last five, ten years, they produce so many chemicals mm -hmm. in the food that they sell around the third world country. But then they also produce a very cheap, cheap medicine. So if you got a headache, you have to buy medicine. The medicine also chemical. And little by little, we cure ourselves. We cure our each other because of the food, because of the medication, because um, the way we live and where we eat. And we make so much money from all the uh, iPhone and cell phone and all the, you name it. And so the money, the more money the Vietnamese making, the more sick they become. Mm -hmm. A lot of cancer, a lot of um, all different kind of sickness. My family stay away from that because they're from the farm. And they have an old traditional way. And every time they have a joy to go to hospital or doctor, they will seek for the herb mm -hmm. and medicine. So this way, I always, um, when I went there, um, I usually go to Thailand, and I bought a lot of herbs, and I bring back here. And I drink it, and I introduce that to my family, my friends, they all drink it, and they feel good about it. So recently, for some reason, <laughs> I run into a lot of friends who are about my age, or a little older, some even younger, uh, have a lot of problem with health. So <laughs> I help them to take them to Chinatown and get the herb and acupuncture and out there. And one doctor looked straight at my face and said to me, if you want her to be healthy at 80 so she can travel to Vietnam with you and all this thing, you should bring her here when she's 50. <laughs> so I can help her rebuild her and support her until she eighty and still can be healthy and travel. Now, you bring her here with that condition, I cannot help her. But I only can do, you know, a little bit. So that is struck me. I said, that's right, that's true. If I want my car to be good for me for a long time, I have to take care of it. And if we want the body to be good to me, because I have to carry it everywhere I go, I better take care of it. So I just a lot of um, detox and take a lot of herb and be a vegetable, all that good thing in Asia. But as soon as I come here, I got 10, 20 pounds just overnight. <laughs> 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 I eat so much because I love the food and it, I don't do much uh, cleaning. No herb. <laughs> so recently, I thought to myself, I said, okay, uh, perhaps now Vietnam is okay. Eastern East country is okay. With or without me, it survived. Mm -hmm. I had many friends and neighbors. They just keep going to every day. They have that handful of pills. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but some vitamins, some pills, some whatever. And the ring, they like, I eat M and A, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, what if, what if we change the handful of pills with a cup of hot food, nice tea, and little by little, they can say, wow, I feel better. I can sleep well. I don't think too much. And then have meditation courses, and just sing and then enjoy life. You know, just be happy. Um, what's going on around in the U.S. that we see every day is based on people loneliness, uh, depression, and take so many medication, and all of that it have a big effect on your mind and your body. If you take herb, we all know it four elements put it together the body, right? You know the wind, you know the earth, you know the water and and um, 
one, yeah, to my dear one. Now, with everything around us, I have to have that to live, too. If the doctor give me a prescription and I go and I buy pill, I don't know what in it. I don't know what they put in it. Because first thing first, they put me to sleep for days. And I feel very lousy when I wake up. But if I have an herb to my hand, I know what in it. I see what in it. And I know all the herbs, it have a same need for elements to grow. And if I harvest that herb, I put it in my body, I feel more safe for them. Pill. If we can eat the plant that we plant, you call it organic garden. I'm a good farmer. If you have plant, I can come and plant you a garden. <laughs> so you can eat every day. You see what you put in it, and you see what you harvest from it, and you see what you eat and how you feel. Just for 10 days. You don't like it, you can go back your own way. But at least my job is I like to share that. It's just something in me, it's like a call. Because I know I will be 70 soon, and I will be 75 and 80. I promised myself I'll beat my mother one year, i make it to 103. <laughs> Only if I'm healthy like her. Only if I still can walk and can work and can take care of myself. Otherwise, I find a place and go. But I will not hang around with all body useless and put a large spread on the people. I will do that. So just to keep that in mind, we all reach. I don't care how young you are. You will reach 70 one day. You may like it. You may don't <laughs> like it. But be prepared now. Be ready. Because it comes very fast. I never thought I would be 70. But within three years, I will be 70. And then I already told my children where I want to die, in Switzerland. Because my son lived there, and I, I love the beautiful country. But then I said, wait a minute. It's too cold for me in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after I die, my body, you know, destroyed. But my soul still hang around there. Oh, it's too cold. So I changed my mind. I'm back to San Diego. <laughs> See, you have your joy, too. And I have my choice. <laughs> Hi. Hello. I love you. Oh. <laughs> you didn't know about love. Uh, she she loved me, right? And look at how happy she looks. I'm so happy <laughs> to just be with you. <laughs> if you love everyone here just like you love me, you know right. how happy you I can know. be? I yes. <laughs> you know, I have this thing when I, I see people for the first time, I, I say to myself, it's my time to remember them, you know, like we've all known each other, you know. No. Um, and you made me cry. Um, I wanted to ask you, my mother's going to be 90. She grew up on a farm in the Midwest. So, yeah, and then she moved to the city, and it's all meat and potatoes now, but I think growing up on the farm, she explains a lot. Ah, oh, life is hard. I don't know if I want to do it till I'm 100, but <laughs> good luck. Um, I, what I wanted to ask you is, I think they said in the beginning that your book wasn't translated into Viet, for, for, or it's not allowed in Vietnam, or it just isn't translated at all. I translated it right, the book came out, but I never did print it. Why? There's so many people uh, that, that would benefit in the world that don't live in Vietnam. Is there a reason? or The government not allowed it. Well, not we, w no, I mean, we don't care. Th that's fine. They don't <laughs> have to, but there's so many people around the world that might read it. That's true, that's true, but um, it's already printed. I am thinking about uh, well, all right then. Here, yeah, and if somebody want to order it, they can order it. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, uh, but you know, you cannot print it in Vietnam because they need to cut, they need to right, pay off. They right. don't want to do it there. No, I understand. And also, if um, the Vietnamese who live here, right? Okay, again, left wing, right wing. Okay, I am on left, they are on right. That means they take the side with the friends, they take the side with the U.S. and they. Refugee, they come here and they lost a lot. Right. Therefore, they are very much anti-communist. Right. My background is with the communists, and still go back and help Vietnamese. They think that I am communist. So wherever I go, the protesters against me. So if I 
publish my book here, the bookstore will not carry. Mm. So I'm still in between in many ways. Well, then I'm going to pray that it happens because I think there's probably a 13-year-old girl out there besides you that will heal from that. That mm. is, you intelligent woman, you can say that what the 13 years old girl have to do with now, right? I'm no, I mean the 13 year old that's 70 now, that it happened to her too, you know, that yeah, might not know your don't book. See that. I know. That is why cancer, that's oh. why depressing, right. that is why loneliness, that right. is why they not enjoy life like you do. Hmm. That's a different. If you di- discuss it, with them, they will stand up and they will get so mad and they will call name and they will take me out of here. That's oh, no, no, we need you here. Yeah, <laughs> you can't leave. Just keep telling the truth. I'm so happy to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> Anyone else? Hi, Jane. No more questions? No more? Okay. Don't be shy, okay? I see a lot of Japanese, but don't be shy. Fascinating story. Your life is very fascinating. Your strength and what you've been through. I mean, most people would have given up many times. You know, it's definitely an internal strength that you have. Um, my question is just a light question, really. Um, you know, people say when you make a m- movie, I know you've done documentaries, which is different than a big screen movie. How, how did you feel it came out? Did you feel that certain things were exaggerated? I mean, how, you know, you were probably very involved in the process, but it must be very surreal seeing your life on screen and wondered how that felt. How that feels that most of us are not, I mean, I would say all of us, except for you, you know, are not gonna know what that's like. And I'm just curious. Thank you. Um, after the book came out in 1989, the first book, um, Oliver Stone read it. He optioned the book right at that moment to make it a movie. And so um, we met um, at his house in Santa Barbara. So, um, at that time, I don't even know who is Oliver Stone or what the movie he's going to do. But um, my son, Tommy, uh, worked for him. Um, when we, in 1988, uh, I mean, 89, um, three Vietnam veterans are sent to Vietnam to build very first clinics. And Oliver funded money for them to go and build this clinic in my village. And that is, we honor When they come back, we honor them. So Oliver came and honored us and did a big ceremony in Chinese restaurant for $25 place. Okay, so that let you know how much I know about fundraising. <laughs> and so here Oliver come in with private jet and everything, and here he come in a small Chinatown, I mean Chinese restaurant in San Diego. But he's very humble, and he met three veterans, and they all hold each other and cry, and you're not healing for them, too. So my son, Tommy, uh, walked up to Oliver and asked, can I work for you? I, you know, I want to, to work for you. I will do anything. And he take one look at Tommy up and down. He said, call my office, and you come work for me. So then my son, uh, at that time, he started to work uh, for Oliver. first movie is The Doors. Uh, mm-hmm. The Doors. Mm-hmm. Uh, then uh, second movie is Born Four of July. Mm-hmm. And then JFK, and now you can go and see how much he grow from then. But after I watched the doors, uh, then um, you know the rainbow on a TV, uh, on which show Rainbow movie. So when I met Oliver at his house in Santa Barbara, he asked me, what kind of movie do you want your life story to present? And he had a sincere question, and I answer a funny answer. I say, everything but the doors and rainbow. <laughs> and you know what the door? I don't know how many of you see the door, but the movie of the door is <laughs> it's not my kind of movie. <laughs> and um, the rainbow, you know, I don't want to be a rainbow woman. <laughs> so he laughed. He said, No, this is a different kind of movie. <laughs> but then he told me that he said, I have to condensed it down, most books, to two, three hours of the movie, it's going to be, I have to cut out a lot. So I have to cut all your men out, because if I could put all the men you involved with, it takes seven hours. <laughs> 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 and so um, I say, oh yeah, you know, whatever. So what he did, what he put 
two of my husband and one of my lover into Tommy Lee Jong. My husband is not military, he's a civilian. He worked for RMK, uh, build road, he's an engineer, and so he built road and bridges, not military guy. Mm -hmm. He's a World War II. And um, my Dennis, husband Dennis Hayslip, he died in the van, but not like the way described in the movie. So based on the true story, but it little changes to make it the audience enjoy more, I guess. Right. And um, what shocked me the most in uh, the movie was um, the very first rap that Oliver put down. I was so scared because I'm afraid that, you know, Hollywood, they can take a good story and make it anything, right? But when he sent me to review the first rap he written, what he got me, every line from the book to the screenplay, mm -hmm. line by line, whatever he wanted to say is there. And so I was, wow, you know, I thought he will rewrite his own word and his own thinking, but no, everything. So when you watch the movie, you will see that. However, the audience <coughs> did not like the movie, but they liked the books. Because first books <coughs> is about Vietnam uh, in 1950 to 1970. The second book from 1970 to 93, this both book put together and all the audience liked the first book about Vietnam on um, what happened to me there. My life in America is just that it everyday life. The divorce, the problem, the churches, the bill to pay, the gun, all that thing. It everybody's household. So the book is much better if you read the book. But the movie, after you read the book, you don't like the movie. <laughs> and so <laughs> it is the movie is there, yet you don't have time to read the book. And if you always can come back to the book and you get the wisdom, you get the sense of uh, uplifting because it's a very spiritual book. And especially for the veteran, it's healing them. Because I look at them as a, a brother. We have to go in a spiritual sign to see all that. Without Vietnam War, I wouldn't be here. <coughs> Without the veteran went to Vietnam, do what they have to do, we have nothing to talk about. But as you know, just like yesterday, Kerry is talking about what the the world is bringing up Vietnam again. Don't do like we did in Vietnam, and la, la, la. So this is Vietnam, it's an image. It's ugly, it's very ugly past. But we have to bring it up to now and say that it's because of Vietnam. We have a lot of things to discuss for the last 50 years. And it can be another 50 years we still talk about it. And so the sense is, is a lot of veterans learn about Vietnam. And a lot of veterans now stand up for, just like veterans, for peace. They're very much against the war. They won't let their children enjoy the military. They won't uh, support. Um, government. So all this thing, it born a new leaf. It give a new level of thinking. And so you, the movie and the book, it's just something so that we can discuss, we can connect, we can uh, share, and we can learn from one another. And it's there. I don't say that I'm the only one can do it. There are many different movies and books out there. But each of them delivers a different message. And this is the first Vietnamese voice, not politician. It's not somebody that corrupt or whatever. This is just a young girl's what she saw, what she told, and that is based on her story. But it's a very spiritual in it and a lot of wisdom that you can harvest from. Yes, thank you. Just a little twist of irony, wanted to say. Ran into Oliver Stone yesterday. Oh, <laughs> be here? He was in Brooklyn, I, I didn't talk to him personally, but he was in Brooklyn in a coffee shop talking about film and advocacy. You briefly mentioned about the human trafficking. Yes. And I know that many Southeast Asian countries, um, you know, so many young girls are sold and so on, but how about in Vietnam? No different. No, no different? No different. Uh, that's what we just see a little <coughs> bit about this morning. You know, um, yeah, I. 
I saw myself way back in uh, 1967. Um, uh, and in the book, I talk about the war. In the book, I talk about how poor I was, and at uh, 16 years old, being a mother and all that. And so the way for me to quit um, doing black market and all that thing, that's why I need that $400 to uh, grow. Now, at today, I sit and I watch all those young girls, 18, 17 years old, same my age, um, still young in college. Most of them do have baby from boyfriend. At a Vietnamese culture, you had more women than men because they die in the war or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you have a child, nobody marry you. In old days, I don't know today, I cannot say it what happened today, but nobody marry you after you marry once or you have a child with somebody. So therefore, in my case, I have no joy, but I have to move on with marry to American and do what I have to do for myself. And yet today, sad thing about it, the mother, she's so poor, and she wants a cell phone so badly, she has to sell her daughter. For first, it's for virgin, for her virgin, mm -hmm. maybe 1,000, maybe 500, I don't know. And so she, mother, can get a cell phone. All the father need to get a one brand new motorcycle so he can show off to his new girlfriend or something. And he took his daughter to mm -hmm. the city and sell. Now, this is going on a lot in Vietnam, Cambodia. So trafficking, when I've been on the panel discussing in Thailand about the refugee today, especially boat people from many countries and stuck in the um, ocean for many days recently, the question then is how can we help to solve the problem? So I add, like 40 years ago, the Vietnamese refugee, the boat people, they came out thousands and tens mm -hmm. of thousands. The whole world jumped in to help the Vietnamese refugee and boat people. Why today is different? The answer then is that Vietnamese people run away from the communists. Mm -hmm. The Americans have an obligation to help. And the whole world help with the Americans for the refugee and the boat people. Today is different. These people run away because Americans the one that bombed them because of the war and because of economy. That's why they run. And everybody take, just look at each other and not solve any problem. They don't want to do anything to help. So that is the difference. Now how these people, they're not run away free. Each of them, the journalists, they went out on a boat and they talked to each of them. They found out that each of them pay a single person is 2000 A family of five is 5000 So those people, they have to have some kind of money somewhere to pay to get on this boat. Mm. And let's see, it's a like very sad situation, but they found out that this try to get in the bottom of this, it have to go to deal with the people who collect the money and who to sell the boat and who to get the people. Back in 1990, when Vietnamese people wanted to get out of Vietnam, they do three ways. One way is to pay, just like that, two, three thousand dollars to the boat organizer and bring them out. Or they asked me for twenty thousand dollars, I married them and bring them out. Or they just find their own way to escape by foot or whatever. So today it's not different. But again, that is another problem. It's just so big, I don't know how to help. Mm -hmm. And I shame to say I don't help them much because I don't know where to start. Well, I can help the poor and I can help the sickness a little bit, but with the refugee problem, I only can talk about it. One time I was, um, you know, one of the um, seminar, and this gentleman, uh, he is quite, um, I think, uh, fo quite familiar with the foreign affairs and so on. And he told us, if you have a dollar in your pocket, what you should do? 
and uh, we wonder what we should do. And he said, uh, invest girls' education. And he said that the, uh, the countries where we, women has a higher education, they do very well. So um, I thought, you know, really uh, interesting. And then just, uh, but then I've also heard that they're like uh, Cambodia, girls only can get their education up to fourth grade. Yes. And then boys can continue, but they're not the girls. And the girls are the one should earn some money for the family, yes. but they're not the boys. Boys can continue their education. And is that still the same way? In old days, in my family I had uh, three sisters older than me. None of them can read or write. But two brothers, both can read and write. And, and myself, because I went to school in between time, like um, early morning you feed all the duck and chicken and all the everything done. Then I took my water buffalo out the field, work and whatever. And then by 10 or 10.30 in the morning, bring them in, cook lunch for my family while they're still in the field. And then when they come in to have lunch, that's when the time I go to school. So I learned from like two, three hours a day. The person who taught me, she just like a few years older than me. Mm. And so she turned around and just helped me out like a village level, but still have to pay a little bit. So that I'm the only one in the family beside my three, I mean, my two brothers that can read and write. So in 1993, I came in to the Nan, up and up and oftenness. I start out with 100 children. The government asked me only boys. And you have no idea how much I have to fight to get 50 boys and 50 girls. Good. And so today, yeah, girl and boy can able to go to school together. But since 1993 to now, change a lot because people like myself, we not allow that. That is another story about why that Asian, we love men more than a girl. I had three sons, and I wish I had a girl. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. If you see yourself as a leader, I I like to know what you think um, your role as a leader. Thank you. I can be a leader, but not a very good leader. <laughs> <laughs> I give you a couple simple. When I found the East Midwest Foundation mm -hmm. in 1987, that is the time that you had embargoes against Vietnam. In our passport, as a U.S. citizen, it say, as a U.S. citizen, you cannot travel to communist country. That means Cuba, Vietnam, North Korea, China, all of those countries, even Soviet Union. But I'm stubborn. I don't understand that. I ask myself, who are you to tell me where I can go and what I cannot do? And I fight. I fight for my own self. So. I become whatever I want to be, and I just go. I went to Soviet Union with the group of called Youth Ambassador to call off the Cold War in 1985. I sponsored two Soviet Union students in my house for three months, and every day I take them out and say, look, they're Soviet Union, and they look just like you American. So we call off the Cold War, okay? In 86, and even though in my passport say I cannot enter a communist country like Vietnam, I say, yeah, they forget you. I'm Vietnamese, I meet my mom, I go, you know. I use my stupid, stupidness to get my way. That kind of leader I can do. Mm -hmm. And I can get all of you together and I can tell you get up and do something. I can do that. However, when the East Meek wet very poor, I work it on my kitchen table. 724, all volunteer. I can get many, many people volunteer and make a donation and all that. I can be leaders. But when you got in so much money, I can be leader. Because money come, it corrupts. Mm -hmm. It change people mind, it change people heart. The goal that I see that want to help the poor it's not no longer there. It's now they're fighting the board, divided. They're fighting who got paid what. The fly first class, 
They do this, they do that. I'm powerless. I can't fight. Because in American system, you have to have money to hire a good worker. You have to have money to do this and do that. And if a $1,000 come and you pay out $800, $200, you can help Vietnam. It's not going to be good. It's supposed to be another way around. But when the money comes, it's corrupt. And that is when I say, you can have it. And that's why I walk away. When foundation um, met, I was on a newspaper in San Francisco, and the gentleman named uh, Jolly Free, he's the founder of Duty Free uh, Company all over the world. He's a billionaire. He's here in New Jersey. He come in and he say, I will help you so much per year for 10 years. You talk about billion of dollars for Vietnam. And people on our board and some of veterans that who have big guilt, big uh, ego and all that, they come in and smell that money. Oh, see a former, see not educated enough to be leader, see this and see that. I say, you can help it. I'm not a good leader, I know. I only good leader that I have to be hand on everything. I have to watch every dollar come in. I have to know where that money goes. But if I don't see that and I don't agree with that, I'm not involved. So I walk away. When it's very poor, I carry it on my back. But when it's so rich, somebody I can help it. And that's why I found the second foundation they call Global Village Foundation. I work at I go and I do what I can with it. And when I cannot do anymore, I don't take the money, I don't do fundraising, I don't do much. I do whatever I can. So I'm not a good leader. If an honest leader, I'm volunteer and I'm proudly to say I'm homeless today because I don't have a home, no country, and I don't have a, 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 a anybody back me up anything, it on my bare hand and with my hard working. As a true leader, you do that for yourself. <coughs> but if you a good leader like Donald Trump, <laughs> you can vote for him if you like your style of leadership. I'm opposite. So I'm a good leader, but not a good way of a big leader. Can Thank I answer you. your question? Yeah, very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, this is not a question, it's just a vote of appreciation for your honesty and your down-to-earth uh, teaching. Uh, I could see a very honest soul and appreciate uh, whatever you said. Thank you. <laughs> I let the uh, one short interview with you, uh, probably on the uh, website of your foundation or something. Interviewer asked her if uh, you forgive the uh, rapist, not a rapist, rapist. So, and um, she didn't say so, but uh, my impression is, what? Forgive what you are talking about? Her answer is, of course, because everyone, everything I met in my life helped me to make me now. This is real forgiveness, right? And the reader's mind, right? <laughs> so, and uh, I know everyone here already fell in love with her, but uh, I bet you will love her more after this. This is a song of forgiveness and uh, in her book. So she will sing this song. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Um, can, now, this song is... Um, not, not that one? Not, not, oh, yeah, okay, yeah we could not find it in the book for some reason. We're looking for it, but we okay. couldn't find it. But, this song that uh, I describe when I return to my village. And you watch the movie, you hear this song in the background, but it's also in the book. And I like to sing this song, but I want to sing ahead of it. And I want to sing the forgiveness song because it's oh, okay. oh, yeah? okay. it really um, a very nice 
up and down, and it really bring you you out. And so um, I just want to sing it just a little bit to to see that the feeling when I returned to my village in 1986. Okay, and then I stop. And then if you can just close your eyes and just uh, let you freely go, and then if anything that you hold again anybody or have any feeling again towards somebody, something, just let it go and just forgive them. Because the more you forgive and let go, the more you feel better yourself, feel lighter, and uh, you feel um, um, forgive yourself the most. And um, so this is just... Um, little advice. But let me uh, sing this song when I go back to my village. And this is a village folk song, and I create that. So I have to stand up so I can get some, <laughs> <laughs> some air. Okay, so. Okay. This is also in the movie, too. Uh, here, the girl play me, she sing it. So, um, you know, you're thinking about, just, just you aim it in your mind, it, it's a late afternoon. And in the second book, I described the sea when I come into my village. And um, in those days, uh, American people or like myself who live in overseas and come back to Vietnam and come to my village, you will go in jail right away because you're not supposed to. But I sneak in, and the way it, my sister uh, come out and get me and hide me and all that, it's just very, very powerful. So I um, created a song just to... Uh, describe that day. So I just sing a little bit in front of it. Ai về hòa quý quê tôi Nhìn bãi cát trắng trắng ngời như bông Lại đây qua bước dần sông Bến lồi bến lỡ Sát đồng mắng quang Thị nghè bại giảng hội an Khái tay ly lạc nghĩa trang Má màu Did it describe my village is um, where my father came from? Which village my mother came from, uh, with the water flu and the graveyard and all that. <coughs> just for you. And the forgiveness song with it in the book, it I describe about this young man <coughs> who went to war, and his fiance stay home, and he asked her to take care of his grandmother because his father and mother died in war. So he got so angry and so hatred that he joined the war to, to fight. And um, while he gone, his fiancé stay home, and his enemy uh, want to marry the girl, want to take the girl away from him, but she re reject him. So he got so angry and killed the grandmother and burned down the house. Mm -hmm. And the girl had to flee to different village to survive. So when the day that the, girl, the guy come back, from the village. And um, he found out that the girl is gone, his grandmother is dead, the house burned down, and his enemy, with his friend from the same neighborhood, came forward to him and get down his knees and say, I, the one, that kill your grandmother and rape your fiance and burn down your house. So now I come back here with the sword, please, chop my head off so I can pay my uh, due and you can be moving on. And the guy take the sword and he raised up the sword. And the bell, the temple bell, ring at noon, evening. And when the sun set behind him, and he heard the monks start to jam, and that is when he stopped. He stopped to pray. And he asked the enemy, get up and walk away. Move on and don't come back here and I will give so this is the song that it comes from that scene, and it's very moving. So you can just let go. Tiếng chuông chiều tranh đành từ nơi đây như cảnh tình những linh 
nâu đã lọt mau giấc ngủ quay về quỳ dưới cội bồ đề nôi gương đấm chí tôn gạt bỏ chuyện tình xưa những cơm dỗ mê sai thù hẳn tiền tài chất phẩm quyền cao nhìn cúc đời đau khổ thêm ngao ngán chán trường nếu ta cứ lai oan trả thù thù oan sẽ dầm dài nôi gương từ bi hỷ xã ta xá bỏ hẳn thù